Thank you everyone that's joining us today. We are here to celebrate the Writers of the Future, volume 36, which has come out recently and features many wonderful stories by the year's contest winners, including two who we have with us today, both F.J. Bergman and Andy Dibble. I recently, uh, this morning, reread their stories in the collection and I was just as blown away the second time around. So we will be sharing a link in the chat for a second to where you can get the book. And we will also be having a brief interview with both authors, as well as they will be blessing us with a reading. And uh, should, be, should be a wonderful day for us. So let me, uh, on to the introductions. F.J. Bergman edits poetry for Mobius, the Journal of Social Change, and is the former editor of Starline, the Journal of Science Fiction and Fantasy, uh, the Journal from the Science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association, and imagines tragedies on or near exoplanets. She has competed at, natural, at the National Poetry Slam as a member of the Urban Spoken Word team, and her work appears irregularly in speculative markets that don't pay enough to be pro, and literary journals that should have known better. A catalog of the Further Stars, a collection of dystopian first contact expedition reports, won the 2017 Goldline Press Poetry Chapbook Contest and the 2018 Science Fiction Poetry Association's Elgin Chapbook Award. She lives in Madison, Wisconsin, inside a towering library of science fiction, fantasy, and horror novels with her husband, Fred, and Wiley the Cat her spawn within bicycling distance. She works as a freelance book designer and copy editor for several horror and literary presses. Andy Dibble also lives in Madison, Wisconsin and works as a healthcare IT consultant. He has supported the electronic medical records of large healthcare systems in six countries. He has a long history of volunteering as a programming language instructor and a less fulfilling history in software development. While not writing, he spends his free time reading, running, and eating sushi. Andy came to writing fiction by way of academia. While an undergraduate, he completed four majors, computer science, religious studies, philosophy, and Asian studies, and published a paper on two of India's great epics, the Mahabharata and the Bhagava Purana. Get that Close right? enough. <laughs> In pursuit of a career as professor of South Asian religion, he completed a Master of Theological Studies at Harvard Divinity School. Along the way, he realized writing about abstruse Sanskrit text for a living wasn't for him. Unfortunately, giving up on academia also meant giving up on many opportunities to publish. Fortunately, writing speculative fiction brings new publishing opportunities. So without further ado, we'll get into some readings for a little while and then move on to a QA. and a uh, FJ, would you like to start? Sure, I can do that. A prize in every box. We begged for the brand name cereal as seen on TV. In aluminum silver cylindrical boxes lined up on the supermarket shelves like a phalanx of spaceships with twice the nutrition of oatmeal. Hints about the prizes appeared in commercials. Wind-up robots, tiny books, toy store gift certificates, even the keys to a mansion and other special prizes. We tried to include cereal as a basic food group at breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snack time. When the last speck slid from a box, we would immediately rip open the next and root through its oddly slithering flakes, translucent as shed snakeskin. In less than a week, three boxes had somehow toppled from the top of the fridge to spill on the floor, and Lucy had to throw up right after breakfast twice until our mother issued an ultimatum. The only reason our mother kept buying it at first was that most of the prizes were coupons for 50% off another box of cereal. The nutrition information on the side of the boxes was phrased in an unusually convincing manner, however. 120% USRVTOL recommended levels of arachnozone. Results of recent studies published in the Journal of Def 
developmental confrontation suggests that this stool promotes general rectitude, reticence, and well-formed stools. And she continued as a loyal customer, fondly watching us for signs of advanced traits. She took little interest in the prizes, only saying, if those keys turn up, you let me know right away here. But we didn't think she really believed they existed. We believed in all of it. We were the faithful, the elect. Inside the margins of summer, imagined destinies filled each day with fantastic colors. The first interesting prize was from the fifth box. The first four had enclosed coupons for more cereal. A small book with a velvety green cover. A flip book, it showed only a picture of an iridescent bubble rapidly expanding in size as the pages flew past until the end of the book when it appeared to burst. And this was the miraculous part. Would spray a fine damp mist from the last page, smelling faintly of brass like sprinkler fittings. We kept it a secret until Thomp couldn't bear it another second and tried to tell our mother, but she was busy with something under the sink and said if it wasn't the mansion keys, she would leave it to us. We riffled through it over and over until the binding finally snapped and the pages fell out in stained, dripping wads. Subsequently, for several placid weeks, the toys were exactly what we expected. We got an X-ray stereoscopic viewer that allowed us to look at each other's skeletons. Thomp's right thigh bone had an interesting bluish glow toward the top end. Mrs. Tagliello next door's draconian corsets and the plumbing inside the walls. Other toys were an unbreakable egg that shimmied and wiggled like a Mexican jumping bean and screamed unpleasant sounding gibberish in a voice so high pitched that only Thomp and Russet, our English setter, could hear it. And a framed hologram of a winter landscape where the drifts occasionally moved as we watched. All good things must come to an end. My father would say that when it was time to go home from the beach or a picnic. The viewer images faded and went black. The egg became silent and finally disappeared. We were afraid that Russet might have swallowed it, but in any case, we never saw it again. The framed picture gradually filled completely with snow and stayed permanently white. It was only three weeks before school started again. We were arguing about falling back on our ordinary summer games, tearing around in the woods with Russet chasing uncatchable squirrels, and Lucy's determined variations of extreme soccer. Thump occasionally complained that his leg hurt if he ran for more than a few minutes. And then the latest cereal box produced an object that was not interesting at first. It looked like a TV remote, but with no instructions and no indication of the appliance it was intended to accompany. It had a little screen and a grid of four buttons labeled zoning coordination with the little dots above the second O that made it look like an alien language. The button said intensity, which we figured was for volume, reconfigure, enhance, and delete. The English labels were crudely stuck on below lines of symbols that looked like the swirly decorations at the end of each story in an old book of fairy tales we'd gotten from the library. All the other buttons were yellow, but delete was blue. There were hollow indentations on the underside, which didn't correspond to our fingers, but gave a reasonably secure grip, and the device tapered to a point with a knob on the end, sort of like a squat antenna. We wondered what it was supposed to control. There were no directions on its glistening black case, whose surface gave an impression of endless depth beneath its reflective film. Finally, Lucy tried pointing it at the television while Restless Hearts was on and cautiously pu pushed Enhance. 
The episode was kind of gross. The woman who convinced the guy who was married to the lady in a coma that he was the father of the baby she pretended was hers suddenly started to stick out of her clothes a lot more. And the guy kissed her and fell on top of her. And then several other people came in and started taking each other's clothes off and fighting at the same time. And then a couple of dogs joined them. And Russet, who had gotten excited when the fight started, began barking really loudly and wouldn't stop. Mother shouted, David, what on earth are you kids doing to that dog? And we could hear her hurrying toward the living room. I whispered, oh, crap. And Tom's eyes got big. Lucy tried pushing the button again over and over, and the people started moving so fast we couldn't tell what they were doing. The screen on the remote or whatever it was displayed a line of the twisting script, and then a giant flashing question mark in blue. As, mo as mother pushed the living room door open, Lucy scr scrunched up her eyes and stabbed at the blue delete button. On the television, everyone sprang apart panting and began refastening their clothes. The dog slunk out of camera range, and Russet sat down with a sigh. Of course, we couldn't resist trying it again, this time at a safe distance from the house. I'm going to quit there with a story, but I could read a, a couple of poems if you like. I would love it if you would also share some poetry with us. Okay. This one is called Flash. Like a dream, your last breath holds all the time you need to unwind the past from its filmy reel as you become undone. Before each night disgorges its twilight, you strip off clean pajamas and step from the shower dirty. Darkening hairs slither from the brush onto your scalp, while underneath songs come back, then leave permanently. You undiscover poems. One by one books flap their wings shut and are put back exactly where you found them. From the family album, pictures form ranks and march off squadrons of unknown soldiers invading a country without a name. You approach your friends more carefully until you've never met. The love of your life enters and withdraws as the sheets dry, cool, and flatten, and you both lose interest. Cars run backward but strangely confident drivers rarely check rearview mirrors. Horses run backward too. You catch every ball that arrows toward your hand. A water bird rises, wings frozen open from a perfectly smooth river. You come back again and again to the oldest house until one day, you don't leave. You can't remember the beginning. This poem is called Salutary. One, surveillance booths stud all major intersections. Statues, whose images might ignite the public will to resist are shrouded in black plastic, wound in police barricade tape. Missiles streak upward through heavy darkening skies toward their imaginary alien targets. Two, the old red convertible with poetic license plates powered by a perpetual motion machine, will no longer exceed any speed limit. But I do not like the look of the only mechanic in town. Three, a man I do not recognize is giving levitation lessons 
on a hillside in bright sunlight. His students, a gray horse, a calf, a goat, two dogs, and five laughing children drift toward the ground, kick the air, lift and float again. I'd like to say one thing about the last poem. Um, the, the context is different than when I wrote it. I wrote it during the Bush administration. And perhaps you'll recall that um, when Ashcroft spoke pu publicly, he had a statue of justice wrapped up in tarps because her breasts were showing. In the current context, there are other statues that are being covered or taken down. And I want to make clear that I have no objection to the more recent uh, destruction of statues. Thank you, FJ. This is lovely poetry. Was that, did that happen to be from um, the winning collection that was mentioned in your bio? I did not re read from that collection. Um, I could do that later on if we have time. Okay, sounds wonderful. There's some very short poems in that one. Andy, would you like to join us with an oh. excerpt from your story? Sure. Um, a word that means everything. When Pius was assigned to Merck, he assumed he would be translating the Bible into the language of genius octopuses. But the first Thulu he laid eyes on, rendered grayscale by the mist, only humped a lichen patch, distended tongue audibly splathering against rock, tentacle suckers puckering as they stuck and unstuck, vestigial wings like out-of-body lungs flaking over its backside. Thulus were supposed to communicate via tentacle gestures. This thrashing was it, right? But Pius' visor remained dark. No translation. His last assignment with the Probacarans had been different. They knew first impressions mattered. This tentacly brute didn't even acknowledge him. You're sure this thing is sentient? He called back. His voice echoed queerly in the gloom. Keep it down, Zora said in a church whisper. She was a good guide, by reputation a good ethnographer, but she treated him more like, like a credulous little brother than a client. I thought you said they can't hear. They can't, but the Thulu is on top of the food chain. Zora dangled her fingers like a jellyfish, made them creep. The right four tentacle of her Thulu suit glided with almost feline surreptitiousness. She snatched her left hand away and her other four tentacle darted behind the nearest hind tentacle of her suit. The visor protruding from Pius's headgear flashed predator. He gulped. In this fog, any predator had to be calculating an ambush. He was down, but sensor mesh con constricted his trigger finger. He chose an cortex, so her gestures were just a symptom of the same neural impulses that animated her suit's four tentacles. Through oblique augmentation, she could control the four hind tentacles of her suit. If it came to flight, Pius had just one option, autopilot. The Thulu the, the led up its humping long enough to radiate a spasm down its limber four tentacles and forced out her hind tentacles. A shrug? Pius's visor proffered disbelief in blocky red print, then corrected itself. Amused disbelief. Pius groaned. What kind of language was this? He expected elegance, a system of symbols like the sign language of proper Karen children who are deaf mute until puberty. Maybe they just thrash around to mate and warn each other of danger, said Pius. That doesn't mean they have language. Did your church tell you that? Zora chuckled like Socrates must have chuckled just before shredding his interlocutor's preconceptions. Just my guess. It could be bureaucratic blundering that consigned him to Merck, but he had to assume the one church hadn't sent him on a fool's errand. Thousands of robots taking millions of pictures all over the region, this region ran pattern recognition devilishly clever algorithms. The same software derived more than a thousand languages spanning over a hundred species throughout the galaxy. 
Just think how few Bible translations your church would have piddled out without it. Church doctrine said that the Holy Spirit doesn't work through software, but brandishing dogma was a non-starter. Maybe a different subject would be more cooperative? There were other males, Sora called the men, scarfing lichen or slalling about as though they belonged to a patch of mist rather than a place, and thaw gray females, ahem, women, haunting the periphery of the seen world. Young clung to the floppy wings on their backs as, as their four tentacles flicked about in conversation. You'll have less luck with the others, where just she let a four tentacle go slack like a bird in some limb she hadn't found the time to amputate. The translation smote the upper left of Pius's vision. Disobedient other? In imitation, he let his shoulder drop, and the whole left side of his Thulu suit sagged. Pius avoided keeling over into the spongy marsh only by windmilling to the other side. His suit would have formed the gesture if he had just spoken the word into his mouthpiece. Light danced in Zora's eyes, but she suppressed her mirth. The Thulu let up feeding, his four tentacles squiggled. Derisive amusement, Pius's visor flared. Why does this one talk, said Pius, unsure how his suit would, would, would react he resisted the urge to make air quotes. Huh, he's just true to his name. His name? Snarky. Snarky made the disobedient other gesture. Pius's headset flashed, oh, the alien is back. Snarky's four tentacles mimed a hug and Pius read the translation, and she brought a friend. Zora nudged Pius. How are you? Pius said into his mouthpiece. His suit... said the accusatory gesture for you meant literally other me. And it is nothing interesting to say, Snarky gestured, as self-important as a four-year-old. He only stood as high as Pius's waist. You really don't think I'm a person, said Pius? Of course I believe I'm a person, Snarky's four tentacles drawing in dizzying self-referential circles. Did the untranslat untranslatability of you confuse him? And that's not what I meant. I know what you meant. I've been through this with her. In the end, we agree to disagree. She, sage alien that she is, believes that there's a shadowy world of squishy objects behind the mist. I say it's impossible. Behind the mist? Where else would it be? Pius was taken aback by Snarky's candor. What am I, then? Just another alien I imagined, proof that I am exceptionally clever or delusional. Maybe I'm just bored. On second thought, Pius remembered Zora saying that the Thulus only believe in their own minds. To them, there were no bodies, no other Thulus. There was no liking to eat, no mist. There were only thoughts of other bodies, thoughts of other minds, mist thoughts, liken thoughts. She had lectured him on brain science. You don't believe the hemispheres of your brain are two different people just because they, they communicate in order to render and interpret the world. To Thulu, that's what talk is like. Scant recognition on his part. She tried again. If you saw your brain, you'd know that the gray matter was you, but it wouldn't feel like you, right? That's how Thulu thinks about other Thulus. He knows they're all him, even though it, it doesn't feel that way. What Pius knew was that he wasn't a brain, but a soul fashioned by his creator. Zora only knew a universe in flux, constantly, constantly prototyping, not a universe vibrant and ushering, a godless materiality. I'll stop there. So in speaking to both of you, uh, I learned recently that not only are you in the same town, which is uncanny that you both won this huge international contest, and right down the road from each other, but that you also both participate in a writing group. Could you both tell me a little bit about that and um, how you've gotten to know each other through that process? Well, uh, I, um, so well, basically, um, FJ in, invited me, um, and I, um, I mean, kind of what we do every week is we all kind of provide prompts and then just attempt to make a story or some something something new out of them, you know, a fraction of them, all of them, you know, what have you. And, and for me, I, I'm a writer that that um, um, I kind of have trouble getting started on, on new projects. You know, first drafts for me can be very difficult, and so it's kind of a way to kind of grow outside of my comfort zone. 
But th that was, I mean, other than, you know, kind of, you know, meeting new people, that was the main attraction for me. Do you have group, anything? The group started out um, as mainly a manuscript critique group where people would bring in finished finished short stories or chapters of novels and and we'd uh, comment on them and critique them and talk about them. But in recent years, um, uh, people left the group, new people came in. A lot of us weren't, um, a, a lot of members weren't producing quite as much. So we began writing um, in the group as well as critiquing work. And that's been remarkably productive for me. If every single week to have a new finished flash piece or the beginning of a longer story or novel is, is just marvelous. I, I really am enjoying what's happening. And it's, it's, it's incredibly fun to see the completely different stories that come from the same prompts, regardless of how specific those prompts are. And did the two of you know each other um, prior to the contest? No. no All right, so. Yeah, it's a great opportunity to meet new people. Um, you know, I met, made a, a lot of new friends, um, you know, after winning. Well, I'd like to move on to some questions I have for both of you. Um, at this point, if our audience has any questions, feel free to add them to the chat room and we will also address those. Um, so I have some questions that are individual for the two of you um, based on your stories specifically, but I also have some more general questions that I'd like to ask both of you. So we'll go into a couple of those first. Um, one of the ones I'd like to ask both of you and Andy, why don't you answer first and then we'll move on to FJ is, what made you decide to enter the Writers of the Future contest in the first place? And how many times did, were you uh, entrant before winning? Um, I'm not sure if I first heard about Writers of the Future over the Submission Grinder, which is, you know, one of the two major sites for kind of finding, you know, markets and, and, and logging your submissions. Or if it was just Googling, they kind of blur together some of the time. But, uh, I mean, basically, it seemed like a, a good opportunity. You know, I, it, it was, it was August of 2017 when I first wanted to publish something, although I, that's when I started writing a novel. Uh, it was only, you know, um, early 2018 when I actually started writing short stories. Um, and this was just, um, um, you know, it seemed like a great opportunity. This actually was the first story that I that, that that I actually ever wrote, you know, that I wanted to to publish. Um, I, I just submitted it the first time to, to the contest, and it 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 wasn't ready. The beginning was long and boring, um, and then when I submitted it again nine months later, that that's when you know, with the much improved beginning and some other things, that's when it won. And FJ? Well, I, I entered because it was free and you could to, to enter and you could win money. And there were two different people in my writing group who had been quarter winners and they'd really enjoyed the, the writer's workshop in LA. And uh, so I just entered as often as I could or, or remembered to send in my entry by the deadline. Um, this this story won the 15th time I entered. I started entering in 2005 and I was some flavor of finalist five times before winning. But but the being a finalist uh, or semi-finalist or whatever really encouraged me to continue trying. That's impressive. For me, it was reject, 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 win. So it was a big surprise <laughs> in my case. <laughs> Yeah. I think either way that goes to show the importance of perseverance in a writer. Yeah. Oh, yes. And it looks like we have a question from our audience here from uh, Terrence Latimer. 
asks, when it comes to completing your projects, when do you know when a project is worth completing or dumping? Never a dump. Um, if you get stuck, put it aside. If you really get stuck, pass the, the thing to somebody in your writer's group and say, hey, can you think of anything, any direction I could go from here? But um, I have um, just a ton of unfinished stories and unfinished poems. And every now and then I go through them and almost invariably I'll go, oh, I can, hey, I can, I can fix that. I can finish that. I can add something more to it and it'll still be incomplete, but it'll be a lot longer. And never throw anything away is my motto. Oh yeah, I, I definitely agree with um, not, not tossing anything. I, I also have a large number of unfinished um, projects. This year has been good for publishing for me, not as good for finishing things. Um, a lot of it is um, kind of knowing when I have a good premise and, that, and that's both an you know, idea, I, I like ideas, but also you know, a good problem for the character, a, a good way to resolve it. And, and once you kind of have that, then you also know it's worth finishing. Because there are, there are a lot of things when like, you know, it's not working and something else seems so promising and you go in that direction and that's not bad. You know, it, it's also bad to spin your wheels on something, you know, when, when another project seems more, more fruitful. All right, and here's another question for the both of you. Um, and we'll start with FJ on the answer and move to Andy. How has winning the Writers of the Future contest changed your career? Not at all yet, but if I can ever finish a novel, it will definitely be a feather in my cap for the cover letter to publishers and agents. Um, yeah, it's so for, you know, career wise, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm ambivalent about whether, you know, writing would on that. I mean, I've, I finished a novel, but I actually don't think it's publishable to be honest. It was, you know, a big project for me, you know, I'm glad to have done it, but um, um, I, I think actually making that be publishable would be writing a new novel, basically. Um, so, so maybe someday, but not now. Um, I mean, I still plan on, on, you know, writing and publishing more. I mean, I, I write almost every day. Um, and, and that's fine for now. I mean, I'll, I'll probably, you know, go back to writing novels at some point, probably once I, you know, I have, you know, another story, you know, published, you know, a, a, a pro, uh, you know, be given more attention, you know, expand it into, into a larger work. And for both of you, again, what was it like having your stories illustrated and what were your initial reactions to seeing the artwork that had been done for your stories? Well, I'm also a visual artist and I've even entered the illustrators of the Future Contest a few times, but I've almost never illustrated my own work. So I really enjoyed seeing what the story evoked from another artist. This is, um, I don't know if this is visible. This is uh, a colored pencil drawing I did for the cover of an earlier chat book. Lovely. Um, I'm, I'm not a visual artist, but it's, it's very flattering to have your, your, your writing um, illustrated, to know that, that someone, you know, read it, you know, several times, poured over it, to, you know, figure out the right way, the right place, you know, the right way to, to represent a certain, a certain moment in your story. Um, and, and, and not just that moment, too, you know, to kind of, you know, represent the whole piece. Like, you know, in, and I'm not sure if I can show it, but well, It'll be really hard to show the particular piece of it, but I can give you a sense of, of, um, let me, one moment. So this is the, uh, hopefully you can see it okay. 
Um, that's the illustration of my story, which actually is, is that scene with Pius, Zora, and, and Snarky. But one, one cool thing, thing the, the illustrator did was um, kind of make, make stars just, you know, barely showing through the mist, which, which is, you know, it thematically draws into the story later on, which I never would have thought, thought, thought to do that, that, that kind of thing if I had illustrated it. And then um, to more specific questions, FJ. Oh, yes, that the artwork is tremendously beautiful in this year's in this year's volume thirty six. Um, FJ, I have known you primarily as a poet uh, with your work with the Science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association. Have you always written fiction as well, or is this something that's fairly new for you? Um, it's it's newer than poetry. I wrote poetry in high school and college. I um, stopped writing for decades while I was doing other things and then began writing poetry again in 1998, August 1998 to be exact. And in about 2000, I began submitting poetry for publication and started writing fiction at about that time. And how does the process of writing fiction versus poetry differ for you? Fiction is mostly adding dialogue and emitting line breaks, although I'm not that good at dialogue. I, there's, there's perhaps, um, there are some things that can be achieved through line breaks and enchantment that can't be done in fiction per se in prose. And I also write prose poetry and while I, I I like to think that I know the difference between prose poetry and flash fiction when I see it. I couldn't explain um, exactly where that line should be drawn. And Andy, um, what made you decide to take on themes of religion, communication, and translation in your story? Um, well, oh, excuse me. I, I mean, for me, the, um, it kind of started with, um, I, I mean, I thought the, the idea of translating the, the Bible into alien, alien language is really cool and fertile, um, especially when I realized just how many ways the opening to the Gospel of John can be translated. That, that's actually where my story goes later on. Um, and then it, I mean, and there were some moments there too, like, like, you know, translating it in a way that's ostensibly the opposite of what the author intended and how that could be, you know, theologically and, and textually justified. Um, and it kind of grew from there. I mean, I, I had to have aliens and, and I realized that the kind of expansive way of having, you know, multiple races, um, you know, really fit thematically with it. And, you know, a lot of my background played into this. So, you know, kind of my background in philosophy is what inspired, you know, these aliens that are, you know, you know, you know, solipsistic. They, they, they only believe in, in themselves and not anything else. Um, and, and that really kind of, I liked the idea of, you know, kind of the depth or, or the difficulty of the problem of, of trying to communicate with people that don't even believe that you exist. It, it, it struck me as a very kind of striking, you know, fertile problem. And um, so you have a degree in, in um, divinity and you've studied a lot of theology. I, I wonder, um, have you ever done any translating yourself? Are you bilingual? Um, and if so, what difficulties did you encounter and, and how was your background helpful? Um. I'm not bilingual, uh, unfortunately. I've had exposure to lots of languages. I mean, my, the, the major language I actually studied, um, other than English, of course, um, is Sanskrit. I had three and a half. I had three and a half years of Sanskrit, um, and and I mean, translating, you know, from Sanskrit in into English. And you know, I, I have I have written some Sanskrit too, so the other way. Um, a little, not, not, not a lot of, of writing in Sanskrit. Um, 
um, it, it's for me, it was very laborious, um, you know, kind of knowing what it's a very ambiguous language, which is actually what what part of, you know, partially inspired, you know, my approach here that in Sanskrit, you know, there are words that have like 30 meanings. So why couldn't there be a word that means everything? Um, and, and so it's had to go from like, well, I know what the grammar could be, the various options, sometimes the, the, the very, very large number of options, and I know what the words could mean, but how do you go from that to like the picture, you know, on the level of sentences and paragraphs, and, and, and that was a very hard process for me. And actually, with a lot of what, you know, kind of, you know, led to me, you know, giving it up as something that, that I did in a big way. Um, I mean, there are career things too, right? I, I, I mean, it, it's much easier to make money, you know, in, in IT than in, in Sanskrit, which there are very few jobs in, for better or for worse. But, um, but yeah, yeah, that, that, uh, that kind of, you know, getting, getting the big picture probably was the hardest thing for me. And back to FJ for a moment. Um... Your story has a strong sense of nostalgia in it. You know, it, it made me immediately think of being a child and the excitement of um, getting a prize or a toy in the cereal box. Um, I wondered if this was an intentional device for you, and if so, were you writing with a particular audience in mind? No particular audience. Um, I think uh, what I was thinking of more than anything else was... Uh, was Cracker Jacks from, from my own childhood. But um, certain aspects of the story are dated, but I often try to evoke a false nostalgia, a nostalgia for objects and events that aren't, that aren't possible, that never existed. Well, very accurately done so in, in this particular story. Um, back to Andy, I wondered, uh, you, you've worked as a computer programmer, and I wondered if writing in programming languages has affected your view of linguistics. Um, it sort of. So, I mean, I don't have, I mean, so, so Sanskrit does have the oldest tradition of linguistics or any language, you know, back in 400 BCE, there was a, meta, a metagrammer written for it. So a long, long time ago. So it's very unique in that respect. And also, it's also a computationally very um, unique language that uh, Noam Chomsky, you know, really famous guy in, in cognitive science, linguistics and computer science, and also de developmental psychology. Um, you know, his, his work with context-free grammar actually, actually mirrors, you know, in Panini and in, in, in 400 BC, his work on Sanskrit grammar. Um, so yeah, th that's fun. Um, I mean, I like, I guess more, more generally though, computer science is kind of part of my overlapping background in linguistics. I never had a course just in linguistics, but I've, you know, you know, programming languages, um, you know, how, how they're compiled, you know, th their formal structures, also artificial intelligence, you know, um, a, a big piece of that is natural language processing. You know, how, how, you, how a computer can be used to assess the sentiment behind, you know, a, a sentence, you know, um, understand human language, produce human language like we do. Um, it's, it, I mean, natural language is very, very different from computer language. Um, you know, we, 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 we have all, all kinds of ambiguity, um, you know, we, we say one thing, but mean, but actually mean another thing. We, we, we leave things out that you have to fill in and, and, and listeners do a great job of that. Um, but computers, it's much, much harder to, to get them to figure that kind of thing out. And FJ, um, I was in rereading your story today, I was curious, uh, what made you decide to write from the perspective, perspective of children and what challenges uh, did this propose for, uh, bring up for you? Um, he's a, the narrator is, is a smart kid. Um, he's the oldest. 
and I think um, there's a lot of fiction, especially um, fiction written for younger kids. And I read a, a lot as a child, as well as a, as as an adult, uh, where the focus is on the child as the as the main character and not the adult. I I was a parent um, already when I I wrote the the story, but somehow it didn't occur to me to write it from the parents' POV. I I couldn't tell you why. Okay, fair enough. Um, let's see here. And Andy, uh, I noticed in, in one short story, you managed to get a bunch of different rich alien cultures into a very small space uh, with all of the difference that, that those implied. Uh, I wanted to ask, what is your favorite thing about writing alien cultures and how did you condense so much information into a small piece of space? Um... I kind of want to say mostly good luck, to be honest. I, I didn't outline this. Um, um, I mean, it, it started with, with the Thulus, really. Um, and, and I mean, th them being my, my major culture, of course. Um, and the, the next one, which gets later in the book, um, you know, these kind of sand dune beings, um, that was basically, that, that came out of the, a certain translation puzzle. Um, and I mean, that, that section I worked on many hours to get it right, um, to condense it down to what, what it should be. Um, and then, you know, the last one here, which I mentioned briefly and what I read, the, proper Karens, um, they, I, I mean, that kind of thinking, you know, I had played into it early, but I actually hadn't added them as like actually given them a scene um, until a week before I submitted it, mostly because I realized the story wasn't balanced. I had a backstory for one of my main characters, but not for the point of view character, which seemed so totally off. And unfortunately, there, there was a great place to stick it in, so I did, and it worked out. Um, but it, it definitely could have turned out not as well, I think. Um, some, I mean, some of my stories, I mean, I don't, I don't outline extensively normally. Um, I kind of brainstorm for a while and then get writing. Um, and sometimes it doesn't work out so well. I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good at endings, but could slow down in the middle or, or what have you right you know you know lose that thread so yeah it looks like we might have lost fj i do have a few more questions for you though and uh, we've got about 10 minutes left so if any of our audience has any questions please get them in now um i also wanted to ask you what are some of your favorite books that have inspired you to write Books that inspired me to write. Um, well, my favorite author overall is um, Jorge Luis Borges. He only wrote he only wrote short stories. Uh, more writers sh sh should take his advice. Well, he also wrote essays too, but but, but he wrote no novels. Um, but and, and actually, his theory of translation um, did did kind of play into this um, because you know he, he thought that that um translators should should be so as long as you realize that one question is is aesthetic to, to, to produce better art um and kind of you know literature if it's add details remove details um and um uh, hopefully people can hear me saying that my internet's not great. Um, but the, um, the that that they sh should be able to function, you know, much like uh, illustrators do. You know, illustrators are allowed to to you know a you know add things to a scene. You know, you know, remove something for emphasis. They don't have to have to depict, um, 
you know, what said in the story exactly. And translators should have the same license because they can improve, you know, literature. Um, so so he, he's one thing. Um, but normally my, um, um, I'm actually inspired to write actually by nonfiction because it gives me ideas and I like ideas in fiction. Um, I mean, like I, um, you know, read a book on, on synthetic um, biology and, you know, that got me writing a story about, you know, a futuristic culture that, that would attempt to change um, the handedness of, of all the proteins in their body to make themselves immune to pathogens. Um, like the, um, oh, I do know one of my stories was inspired by, there was a, a really, really boring translate, translated story I read once, but it had th this little detail. And I, and that got me writing a story about, um, government by, by, by life insurance companies. That was a fun story. Um, so yeah, it, it depends. And what are your plans now after winning the contest? Um, keep writing, um, mostly. It, it's, it's, I, I, I don't know. I don't really have like a five or a 10 year plan here. It, it's, I mean, the concepts did, did somewhat kind of rescue me from, you know, thinking that I'm not a fiction writer and I should go back to writing essays. Um, but um, it, it's like, I, I mean, I, at this moment, I don't see my career being writing just because I'm pretty happy with, with my current career. You know, it gives me stability. I want writing to be a, a big piece of my life and I'm gonna, you know, every morning I'm gonna keep writing and if the story's working, it'll be that. If that's not working, then I'll write an essay and, you know, it's a good life. And we have um, a Oh, sorry. We have a question from the audience from Dan Fitch uh, for Andy here. What are your favorite non borge stories that involve translation as a key element? Mm, that in is non uh that involves translation. Ooh. Um I'm trying to think of of um of good examples. I mean, I can think of their, um, I can think of kind of a, a, a literary phenomenon. So a lot of people he have heard of the, um, the, th the this, gr this big collection of stories, the, the Thousand and One Nights, you know, also called the Arabian Nights, you know, which inspired Aladdin. Um, and, you know, that, that, that's a very large collection that, um, um, it, it's, it's been a lot across a lot of the world in terms of its development because, you know, it's early, you know, it, 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 it kind of, you know, it, it moved throughout the Persian and, and Arab world, you know, an earlier version of it was in India where, where it was the ocean of the streams of stories, which supposedly was first written in a demon language called Pisacha. Um, and and so th that's been translated many times, um, and incidentally, Borges also actually wrote an, uh, an essay about an essay about translating the, the, the Thousand and One Nights, um, which he talks about um, that supposedly the first European translator of the Nights, um, Galland or something. I think 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 that was it. Some French guy. Um, I, I'm not so I'm not so good with names. Um, that that he probably actually made up the story of Aladdin um, because it wasn't in, in any of the Persian or Arabic source materials. And Borges liked that because, um, you know, he's just adding to, to the tradition that's already basically infinite. Um, um, and so it, it is funny that at least quite possibly the, the most famous uh, uh, of the knights was invented, you know, much, much later on. Well, thank you so much, Andy, and thank oh, you to- Oh, Storm had a question still. Oh, do we? Yeah. Um, that story about the, uh, I assume he means the, the um, story about a government by life insurance companies. 
Oh, you mean a different one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been trading stories. So, um, yeah, I, I'm just about finished with a story about time trapping Buddhist monks. Um, really immersed in a Buddhist worldview. It's a, 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 a big reason for that is a lot of how Buddhism is done in this part of the world is um, it's either focused on kind of psychologizing it. So all the demons and the heavenly beings are just kind of psychological drives and, and really the whole cosmos is just kind of a, a reflection of your mind. And it's all very kind of individualized. Well, the other approach is to collapse, you know, Buddhism to merely be like, like some kind of uh, analog in science. And, that, and, and that's a way of, of kind of um, validating, you know, Buddhism as being real and Um, I, I, I kind of dislike either of, either of his approaches. So one thing I was trying to do in that story was um, um, kind of, you know, paint th 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 this broad, your rich view of a, a kind of a, a mythological Buddhist cosmos that many people in the world actually believe in today. Yeah. FJ, you're back. Wonderful. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I'm having some major internet connection problems all of a sudden. So if I disappear again, let's hope that won't happen. Well, just have one more question for you. And I wanted to thank both of you so much for being here, as well as all the wonderful people at Writers of the Future. I um, okay. wanted to ask, FJ, what are your plans now after winning the contest? What comes next for you and what current projects do you have? Well, sending more stories to genre markets, um, uh, trying to, writing more stories, uh, trying to finish novels. And I've got uh, about at least half a dozen full length books worth of poems that I, I need to compile and send out to publishers. So I'm, I'm trying to work on that as well. Lovely. And I also meant to ask earlier, how has working as an editor um, altered the way that you write? Oh, it's really instructive. And it's, it's changed the, the way I submit. I don't bother with much in the way of cover letters. And I just, you know, fire off batch after batch if I can find the time to do it. Um, the more you submit the more you get published. Tastes vary so much that there is no telling what an editor is like. I think there's no such thing as being unpublishable or not being good enough to be published. Whatever you it is you are doing, someone out there will really like it. So per perseverance, which you were talking about earlier, that is the, the, the main um, trick to getting published more than anything else. Well, thank you so much, F.J. Bergman and Andy Dibble. It's been a pleasure to have you join Space Cowboy Books here and to talk about the wonderful Writers of the Future anthology. You both totally deserve the win. Uh, it's a wonderful book. Read it twice now, <laughs> and I'm still loving it. Uh, for our audience, we have a link in the chat uh, to be able to get the book. and. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us, and thank you to the Writers of the Future staff for helping us put this together. Wonderful thank to meet you both. I hope to be hearing from you again. You will. Thank, thank you. you so much for doing this, John Paul. Anytime. And thanks to our audience for joining.